This question determines your complete personality, especially if you're a man, but also if you're a woman. So in this video, we'll talk about being the underdog versus joining the bandwagon, David versus Goliath, the making of superheroes and why they can never be too overpowered. And also we'll talk about sports and how there are ring chasers and glory hunters this video will be amazing. And I'm not telling you this because I'm recording it. It's, it just will. Just trust me, okay? For the first time, I'm using a PowerPoint presentation on this video. And to be very honest with you guys, I tried to record this once, but I got too distracted. So I recorded another video that went out before this one. You can click on it somewhere. And it's about being an underdog and how this relates to your complete personality. So this is the first question and a very important question. Are you a bandwagoner or are you an underdog? And this has much deeper implications than you may think. And by the end of the video, you will understand what I mean. So first of all, let's start with the bandwagon effect. For those of you who don't know about the bandwagon effect, it's about when our desire for harmony or conformity sways our decision making. Or in other words, when you know that society or your parents or your boss are saying that you should do one thing, you should go one way, but deep inside, due to your gut feeling or due to your thoughts, your rationality, somehow you know that what they're saying is wrong. So you have this divide, this crossroad. Should I go this way, the easy way, the way that everyone says that I should be going, or should I go that way, the way that my gut feeling tells me that is the right way for me, the way that, that I know is the right answer actually? So this is the divide. And this is the bandwagon effect because to most people, they like to conform. And if you're here, I know that you are not one of the most people. You want to join the band because you know this band is the right one for you. You want to join a team because you know this team is right for you. Because you think for yourself. You don't let others think for you. And I really appreciate that you're letting me have the chance to talk to you right now. Because you are a free thinker. And I appreciate that. So let's go back to David and Goliath, because David and Goliath is the quintessential underdog story. And I'm sure 99.999% of you know the David and Goliath story by heart. But to those of you who don't know, Goliath was this giant, and we're not sure how historically accurate this is, if he was just a very tall man, or if he was an actual giant. But Goliath was a giant that was raising through David's village or David's kingdom. And of course, David was just a regular Joe. And the story is about a regular Joe beating the giant. And of course, David couldn't beat Goliath at his own game. So David couldn't brute force his way to beating Goliath because Goliath was huge. And David was just a regular dude. It wasn't especially strong, he wasn't especially big, but what he did have was wits. And that's how he beat Goliath. He beat Goliath with his wits. I forgot the word in English, guys, sorry. But you know, he, with his slingshot, that's how he beat him. He hit Goliath in the head with his slingshot, and that's how Goliath fell to the ground, and while he was on the ground, David finished him because David could never beat him at his own game. And you also will never be able to beat the big guys at their own game. That's why you need to think about asymmetrical gains and asymmetrical fight, asymmetrical wars, whatever it is in your line of business. But you won't be able to beat the big guys if you do the same thing they do because they will always be able to brute force win. 
So they will be able to have more resources, more money, more people, and they will always win at their game. That's why you need to have a complete different game. You need to change the game, change the rules, get the rule book, rip it off because you won't beat them at their own game. Like David didn't beat Goliath at his own game. And then let's go back to superheroes and why are superheroes such interesting stories? Of course, usually when we start liking superhero stories, we are kids. So as kids, we are fragile. We can't beat the adults. If, if they want to brute force their way, they will beat us a hundred times out of a hundred. And also they have the authority because of that as well. And because usually they are smarter, they, they should have the authority after all. But when people write superhero stories, they never make them too overpowered. So Spider-Man, he doesn't start out being this super cool dude that gets the girl, the super cool dude that is the jock at school. No, he's just a regular dude, a regular nerd, and he's an orphan. He loses the person that he loved the most in the beginning of the story. Also, Batman, okay, he's rich. He's a rich boy, but he loses his parents when he's a little kid. Daredevil, he was blind, and he also loses his dad, who was the person that he loved the most. And even Superman, who is overpowered. He is the most overpowered superhero that I know of at least. But even him, they had to invent kryptonite in the story. So kryptonite is a ploy in the story so that Superman isn't too overpowered because if he could be any challenge that they put on his story, what would be the point of reading or watching the story if you know the ending? That's why in every story, we have the hero arc because people crave relatability. And this, you can use this in your copywriting. You can use this when you're telling a story to your friends and family. You can use this in anything, the hero's arc. So the hero has the call to adventure, which in the case of uh, Spider-Man, for instance, it's when his uncle Ben is murdered. And this is the worst thing that can happen in Peter Parker's life because it's the person that he loves the most. Then he has the supernatural aid. In the case of Spider-Man is the radioactive or the genetically modified spider that bites him. In the case of Superman, it's his superpowers. In the case of Daredevil, it's also that chemical thing. It's his um, 3D vision that he can see through the sounds. Each of the superheroes or the heroes really has some kind of, of supernatural aid or of a special kind of aid. For instance, Batman doesn't really have a supernatural aid, but he has all of his props of his gadgets. And he's also a super strong dude. And you have all of this hero journey, you need a helper, you need challenges and temptations. So there will come a time in which the hero, he will think of, wow, am I doing the wrong thing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Should I go this way or that way? So you always have this kind of temptations and challenges in a hero's journey. And then they go to the abyss, which is the contrary to to the peak so it's the valley of the story when they are they are on the ground they are thinking of giving up it's like rocky balboa when he goes down on the fight and he's thinking of giving up and bloods bursting through his face but then it's not about how hard you can hit it's about how hard you can get hit and get up again so that's the transformation, the atonement, and the return. So people crave relatability. 
getting back to this, if the hero would just go on an upward trajectory, up, 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 or even worse, if he would start here at the peak and he's always on the peak and he's always overpowered and he's always winning, 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 there would be no fun in the story. Who wants to root for the team that always wins? I know you know who wants to root for the team that always wins. But this is why I said that this question about the underdog has to do with everything in your personality. And we'll get deeper into this later, but who wants to root for the team that always wins, right? What's the fun? What's the point? Huh? For me, at least, there's no point. You see this? This t-shirt? I'll even stop sharing for a moment. If you can read this, Guarani Futebol Clube. Campinas, 1911. So, Guarani is my hometown team. It's the team that my dad started rooting for back in the 70s. And in his case, he was eight years old and Guarani actually won the Brazilian championship. And it was the first team in the interior of the country. So in a city that's not a state capital and also not in the, in the seaside, because if you think about seaside teams, we have Santos, that's another um, fluke team because of Pelé. But Guarani is to this day, the only team ever that's not from state capital that won the Brazilian championship. And my dad was eight years old when this happened. And it was a crazy time to be alive here in Campinas. That's my hometown. And Guarani had this meteoric rise. It was already a well-established team in Sao Paulo State. It was a traditional team already, but it wasn't a large team by any means. It was one of the up-and-coming teams one of the up and coming underdogs. And in 1978, we went on a terrific run, winning the last 12 games of the championship, beating teams like Vasco, like Palmeiras, that are some of the hugest teams in Brazil. And we actually won the championship. And then we went on a run for the next 15, 20 years with many memorable occasions. So. We went to a bunch of semifinals. We were runners up of the Brazilian championship twice, even being stolen in 1986. And if you know, you know that was the biggest steal in Brazil football history. We also were third place in the Libertadores one. So what and he had an awesome run. But since then, Ever since I started actually going to the games, because the the good phase ended pretty much right after I was born. So I was pretty much a baby in the last dying moments of the great teams. And my generation didn't see this team be a good team at all. Like the only thing we saw was a runner up try at the Paulista Championship in which we were beaten by the Santos of Neymar and Ganso, so one of the best Santos of all time. But that's the thing, who cares? We know we're not gonna be the champions. We know we're gonna have to content ourselves with being in the second division of the Brazilian championship. But who cares? Rooting for a team shouldn't be just about winning the championship, about being able to win every time because if it were what would be the fun because you can have only a couple teams maybe a handful of teams that have an actual shot at winning the championship and it's funny in my case because except for barcelona which i ended up starting to like because of ronaldinho and then later on messi every single team that i've ever chosen has basically <laughs> been terrible for most of the time so i like the new york knicks i like the new york jets in germany i like 
Borussia Dortmund. So basically, I like to root for the underdog. I have this underdog complex, if you will. And I really don't care about it. And I don't care about this because I'm not a glory hunter. And what is a glory hunter? So a glory hunter, first of all, don't mind the guys on the pictures, okay? It's not the guys themselves. It's not Cristiano Ronaldo. It's not Steph Curry or Tom Brady that I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is the people that they just want to join the bandwagon. They want to root for the team that's winning. So, you know, those guys that didn't even know where the Golden State Warriors were from before St Stephen Kerr went to, before Stephen Kerr went there and started that revolution that started winning every team, every championship with Steph Curry, with Klay Thompson, with Raymond Green. And suddenly, after they won one championship and then Kevin Durant joined them and they won two other championships, suddenly everyone wanted to root for the Golden State Warriors. The same thing with Cristiano Ronaldo and Real Madrid. Everyone wanted to root for Real Madrid when they started winning. Or everyone wanted to root for the New England Patriots when Tom Brady was there. So the glory hunters are people that will not hesitate, hesitate to change teams to the one with the highest chances of winning the next time. So maybe next year some guy comes around in the NFL and we have this, let's say we have, let's say Jim Burrow has a great team in Cincinnati and he starts beating Patrick Mahomes every single year. Everyone will stop rooting for Patrick Mahomes. And they will start rooting for Jim Burrow because that's how it works with glory hunters. They don't care about the team itself. They care about being in, in the winning team. They want to be part of the winning team. And this is a quote that I just love by Eduardo Galeano. Eduardo Galeano was an Uruguayan writer, and if you know Uruguay, Uruguay is just crazy about soccer or about football if you're not an American. So this quote is just amazing. So he says, in his lifetime, a man can change his wife, his political party, and even his religion, but he cannot change his football team because that's the thing about glory hunting and about underdogging. When you choose your team, it's chosen. So my team, Guarani, I will die a Guarani fan or my team might end up not existing in my lifetime. And I won't choose another Brazilian team ever, ever, ever. And even the other teams that I said before that I like, I like them, I don't love them. Guarani is the only one that is in my heart for the rest of my life. And I may die, the team may die, but it will be the one and only team. And that's the thing. If you're a glory hunter, if you are one of those guys that would bet on Goliath and they would be on Goliath's side, whatever it was, doesn't matter. We aren't Goliath. And maybe some bigger guy would come someday and they would be, in, in the team, they would be rooting for the bigger guy. They would never root for David. But what can I do? I have this underdog complex. I want to help the small guy. That's why I started this channel, after all. I want to help the guys that deep inside, they are the Davids. They are the people that they know they could be winning. They know they should be winning because deep inside, they know they are better. But sometimes... They don't know how to speak up or how to just use their wits in the right way. And that's why I started this channel. That's all about unleashing your inner rock star, your inner most um, greatest self. But back to ring chasers. So ring chasers in sports would be people that they are undeniably great, but 
they just want the rings. They just want the trophies. So they don't care that much about their legacy, but they want the rings. Or they care so much about their legacy that they want their rings at any at any sake. So for instance, we have LeBron James here with his famous decision in which he went to the Miami Heat. So he went away from Cleveland. That was his childhood team because he's from Akron, Ohio. And he went to Miami to pair up with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh to form a super team. And that was the first time in NBA history that three superstars decided to gang up and form a super team. And he was scrutinized for this. He was criticized so much at that time. And I hated him for this as well because he didn't go to the Knicks. Damn. He should have gone to the Knicks. I was really... I really wanted him to go to the Knicks at that time. I was six, 16, 15. But Kevin Durant was even worse because he went to the championship team that had beaten his team while they were up 3-1 on the playoffs. And they went out to lose 4-3. And even though he had just lost to them, he went and joined them. And that's why people hate on Kevin Durant, because he lost to them and then he joined them. You know, if you can beat them, join them, that kind of thing. He did just that. And of course, they won the next two championships and he was finals MVP because, of course, Kevin Durant is one of the greatest players or one of the best players, probably not one of the greatest most NBA fans will argue of all time. But he will forever have that asterisk by the side of his championships because people will always say, yeah, but he couldn't beat them. He couldn't win the championship when he was in the, on the Thunder. And that's true. And I also put uh, <laughs> Harry Kane over here, but actually, to be honest with him, poor Harry Kane, man. I should have put Lewandowski, actually, because he went from Borussia Dortmund to Bayern Munich, and they were rivals, and Bayern Munich was winning all the time. And Harry Kane, he was playing for Tottenham, and he was there for like 10 years, and of course he wasn't going to win anything in Tottenham. And that's a shame, because I actually liked the team, and I wanted them to win the Champions League when they went to the final with Liverpool, but... Yeah, I wouldn't call him that much of a ring chaser. It's just very unfortunate that on the exact same year, they won 11 times in a row the German championship. And the year that Harry Kane went to Bayern Munich, they don't win the championship and they might end up not winning a single trophy. So Harry Kane will have another year without a single trophy, which is unfortunate for him. So. Getting to the tail end here, but not finishing yet. We still have some things to do. <laughs> Which one are you? Are you the underdog? Are you comfortable with being the underdog, being in a position that you don't know if you're going to win? You don't know. You're not sure because the, the cards are not stacked in your favor. You have a chip on your shoulder weren't born with your buttocks turned to the moon, as we say here in Brazil, or are you a bandwagoner? So this is how I define this. So the underdog, the person that is willing to be in an underdog position, he or she is a free thinker. Whilst the bandwagoner, they're a herd thinker. So yeah, let's just do what people say I should do. Let's just root for the team that's always winning. Let's just, you know, this is the worst thing. Many people, at least here in Brazil, but I'm sure that in other places as well, when the election comes, they vote for the guy that's winning, quote unquote, because it's just a poll that they do beforehand. And who knows, many times these polls are even manipulated 
in one direction or the other. Oh right, yeah, let's let's say that the poles are not manipulated. Of course they are. And many people they don't want to lose their vote, so they vote for the guy that's winning. I know, I know. I know that if you're here, if you're listening to my rant, you know this is ridiculous, but this happens and I hate it. But anyways, the underdog they tend to be more loyal because they won't they won't just change teams when they're going to get stuff or if someone some friend or family member gets sick they won't just ditch them because they're loyal they aren't there for the long run whereas the glory hunter well who cares if you're not good for me right now who cares if you can't if you don't have something to transact if your relationship is always transactional the person can't give you money anymore if your person can get you connections anymore if the person can give you some type of advantage anymore who cares right that's how the bandwagon thinks i hope that you don't think like that because i'm all for the complete opposite okay so the underdog is willing to build the underdog is willing to set a foundation and go upwards with their team with their family with their gang of brothers whilst the bandwagoner they want to flee like if someone if they're making 1000 and someone offers them 1050 they'll go they don't care that they might grow a foundation and make something bigger where they are they just go from branch to branch to branch it's like a monkey swinging from one branch to the other but you know what happens sometimes sometimes you want to get the next branch and you miss and then you have no branch you fall from the trees that's where the predators get you and there's no one to save you because they know you're not loyal they know that you can't be trusted so why will they save you anyways and then finally the underdog is willing to think of other ways that they can beat the the bigger teams the goliaths so they have to think on their feet they have to think about strategy about tactics they have to use their minds they have to use better teamwork because the goliath will always have the brute force advantage they will have more money they will have more resources so if you try to beat them at their own game you will always lose so you have to be strategic about it and finally the most important part and the thing that closes it all and that's why i said that this question determines your whole personality in the beginning the underdog the person that's willing to beat the underdog the person that's willing to put a blue chip on their shoulder and carry the weight of the world on their shoulders if need be they do what's right and Sometimes you might think something is right and down the line you discover it was wrong and that's okay that's completely fine but you're going through your own moral compass you're going through your own gut feeling you're going through your own thoughts so you might one day you discover that you didn't think about this or that situation and then you're like oh my god if i had that data it would be the complete reverse so i should have done something differently and that's okay we are here to grow we're here to learn but you're doing what's right what you think is right in the moment and that's what's important here you're not doing what the bandwagoner does and that's just i'll do whatever everybody else is doing or i'll do whatever everybody else thinks is right so sometimes what's right for you is a path that's completely off the beaten path and you have to have the guts to take that path because it's right for you because you know why if you don't one day you'll be 70 you'll be 80 you'll be 90 
whatever age you get to be. And you'll think about it. You'll think, man, I wish when I was 20, when I was 25, when I was 35, when I was 40, I wish I was braver. I wish I had taken that chance. I wish I had talked to that girl. I wish I had gotten that different job that I never actually gave a chance. I wish I'd done a bunch of things. And if you're a bandwagoner, you'll probably get there and think about all the things you didn't do. You'll never regret the chances that you took and failed because that's a part of life. That's a part of growing. You'll regret the things that you didn't try, the chances that you didn't take, the actions that you didn't do. That's what you will regret. That's what you'll think about. It will never be about, oh man, I wish I had stayed more in the office, you know, and worked my ass off for my boss. It won't be about that. It will be mostly about thinking, man, I should have traveled more with my kids. I should have given them more time. I should have, like I said before, talked to that girl that I liked when I was in college. It will always be about those things. I should have taken that leap that I thought I should have taken. So maybe I wanted to go live somewhere else for a while. Maybe I wanted to start my own business, even if as a side hustle in the beginning. Maybe I should have changed my course when I was in college. I was doing engineering. Maybe I should go. I should go to law or I should go to marketing or whatever it is. Deep inside, you know the answer. Deep inside, you know what your type of should is. And that's why this defines everything. Are you willing to be the underdog if need be? Are you willing to do what's right even when things are stacked against you? They're not stacked in your favor. They're not stacked neutrally. They're stacked against you, against your family, against your friends, against your country. Are you willing to do what it takes when the push comes to shove? Because if you are, you are awesome. And that's the kind of people that I want here in my channel, that I want in the rock and roll to success. These are the people I want to be friends with. These are the people I want in my life. And if you are one of them, that's your crowd as well. We want these kinds of people. The people that when push comes to shove, they'll, like Rocky said, they'll get down, they'll lie down, and they might look and think, and while the referee is counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you think, I can't, I need to get up. And you rise again from the ashes like a phoenix. That's my crowd. So, are you willing? Because if you are, thank you so much for watching. Please share with your friends. Please like, subscribe, comment, all that thing. Because you are one. You are already a rock star. Even if you don't know it yet, you are. You have it in you. And this is the kind of crowd that I want. So thank you for watching. Thank you for coming. Let's just go, go, go.